subscribe. I'm so excited that we're getting to catch up with Elspeth Barnes, who we last spoke with on December 29th in 2015, so almost five years ago. But Elspeth, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell everybody just a little bit more about who you are and what you do. When we last spoke, I think I had um, won the Marathon de Sable, if I'm not mistaken. So I am um, an ultra runner and I have been uh, more or less living from running since uh, 2015, 2016. Running, running coaching. I also had um, a running shop. And um, yeah, I was running races all over the world and um, doing training camps and things. And then, of course, uh, COVID hit us and life has changed a little bit. But um, yeah, so we can come on to that, I guess, when we speak. I mean, yeah, because when we last spoke, we, we actually we spoke quite a lot of um, in quite a bit of detail, actually, about Marathon de Salves and your 2015 win. And I think what would be really interesting is, is you sort of said, you know, making a living from running from 2015 20, into 2016, which sounds you know awesome. What was that like starting? Because you, you did have um, a corporate career before the ultra running. So almost making that full transition to making ultra running your, your profession, your career, how you were earning income. Yeah, no, it is interesting. And a lot of people have asked me that because um, I guess many people, you know, dream secretly of doing something else, <laughs> but uh, sort of feeling stuck in that hamster wheel, maybe. Yeah, I was working as a management consultant in London and um, I started running um, more and more. There's kind of no easy way to to explain it, but um, I changed uh, jobs in 2014 and that enabled me to have uh, more consistency in my working hours and it enabled me to therefore train with more consistency uh, if, you know if I didn't expect to win the marathon de sable that was kind of more it just happened but I had to put the training in and I did some good races leading up to it so I knew I was in good shape and um and um and when I did I sort of realized that now I have a platform, you know, I have to do something with this because I could have just carried on um, doing my job, but I didn't want to do that. And I had, I had started the process um, a few years earlier because my, my father died and I sort of realized that life is short and that I wanted to do something else. So the, some ideas were, were in, in progress, you know, with, um, with the running shop, with a little bit of coaching and sort of just trying to figure out how can I make a living for myself, like not working for someone else. And so winning the Marathon de Sable became my platform. And I sort of, it, 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 I guess it made me just realize that it's now or never. I have to take the risk. I have to kind of dare to jump. And so, you know, I didn't like sort of jump from one day to the next because I knew I had to still be able to pay my bills, you know, pay the mortgage and that. So it was kind of a process, but I started to work part time. Um, I had a very supportive boss and um, eventually I sort of was working so little because I had so many races to run that I realized it's absolutely ridiculous. I just, I'm just going to have to leave this. And then I got the sponsorship uh, deal and that was kind of my safety net. So then I said, okay, this is it. So in January 2016 um, was when I actually resigned and I left about, um, it was three months later. Um, so it, I think it was a week or a few days before Marathon de Sable 2016 that I had sort of finally left the corporate world. What was that year like? I mean, an amazing transition to make. And I know a lot of people will say a brave transition to make. But, you know, like you said, you know, life is too short to be doing something that you don't enjoy. And it was now or never. So just you know, three months into 2016, you're you're starting as a full time runner and being sponsored as well, which is incredible. Tell us more about that year and the races that you did and how it went. You know, looking back at it, it's sort of fascinating because I, in a way, I had reached a goal that I had fought for for so long. But at the same time, that had cost me so much. So 
I was happy, but it was also a year that was really, really tough for me. So, so basically I was trying to obviously train and I, I felt a pressure to be good because I had the sponsorships and I had sort of also the, um, uh, the attention on, you know, I had won the Marathon de Sable in 2015. I had won other races in 2015. So all of a sudden I had created a name for myself. So people expected me to, to continue to win. I was still working part time and uh, my ex-husband and I were also uh, working on our running shop and we were uh, doing that more or less without any additional help you know we had I don't know if we had one employee at that point or not I can't remember but you know it's like when you have a startup it's not like it's making money you know you you just pour your heart and soul and all the money you have into it and then you sort of hope that someday things are going to turn around right so so um so there was that as well and that put a lot of pressure on our relationship. And so actually 2016 was a pretty shitty year. I mean, I was able to leave my job and I did some amazing races. I mean, first I did Marathon de Sable, then I I went to South Africa and I, I raced in um, in the Richterswald, which is like a desert uh, kind of nature reserve. It's absolutely amazing. And then I went to Australia um, and I did a race there in the Simpson Desert in the Australian Outback. And that was um, uh, an incredible experience as well. And then uh, later that year, I did, gosh, what did I do? I should have read up on my own running CV because <laughs> I can't even remember what I did. But I did, I did, uh, I definitely did, uh, did something more. Oh, yeah, I did the Grand to Grand in Utah and Arizona. That's what I did. So after that, I was I was pretty shattered, to be honest. And I I would have done yet another race in Oman, which I which I realized I just have to turn this down. I can't do it. My body is broken, you know, mentally. I'm in bits. And then by that time, which was like October 2016, my ex-husband and I decided to to separate. And so um, so that was very stressful as well for, for a couple of months at least. And, you know, it's, it's complicated enough to go separate ways when you've been together for a long time, but then, you know, you have a, you have a business as well that is basically your child. So, so yeah, so it, it was, uh, I learned a lot of things. I think we both said, okay, would we, if we knew that this was the outcome, would we still have done this? You know, would we have, have, um, gone for this business and and invested so much time and effort into it and I think we both said yeah we would have done it because you know life is too short to wonder what if you know and that would have probably been maybe even worse so there were sort of no regrets but in hindsight could we have done things differently yeah we could have but when you're in the middle of it all it's not so easy to to see that I suppose so I think guess in summary it was a it was a successful year, but it was also not such a successful year. <laughs> I mean, some people don't deal with that in a, in a lifetime. That's a huge amount of stuff. You know, the transition to full time runner. I mean, and I totally get it with the startup and put it, putting everything, the blood, the sweat, the tears, trying to make it work, believing in it, doing everything that you possibly can. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> and then, and then, like the end of your relationship as well. I must have been. And how did you start 2017? So what happened was that I, I mean, I, I was really not feeling very good at, towards the end of, of uh, 2016 or sort of, yeah. Like, I think I moved out in uh, November or something like that. So that was when it became a bit more definite. But we, you know, we kept you know, working together because we, we had to do that. And, you know, we're friends now. I think it's fine. But I felt like I, um, I didn't want to let my fans down. I didn't want to let my sponsors down. And of course I, uh, you know, I had 
created this opportunity for myself, which is what I wanted. So I didn't want to let that go. So I thought, well, I have to pull myself together and I have to achieve something in 2017. And um I decided to go back to Marathon de Sable because what happened in 2016 was, so I won Marathon de Sable in 2015. When I came back in 2016, I finished fourth. Um, I was like two minutes off the podium. So in the end, the margin wasn't um, very big, but, but that's perhaps besides the point. The point is that I was not in the shape that I knew that I could be in. I came there, I was super stressed. I was not, not prepared. I hadn't trained particularly well. And somehow I still managed to like keep my dignity and scrape forth. But I was like, I can't carry on like this now. And now I have been able to put some of these difficult things behind me. Now I have to find a way of, of just you know, really doing this running and, and making it to what I want it to be. And, um, so actually my ex-husband was very supportive. He said, yes, go and train for MDS and I'm going to run the business, um, while you do that. So I was super focused. So that's how we started 2017. It was all about training for MDS and taking away like all other sort of distractions, um, which went reasonably well. And, uh, and I was in super good shape when I came to MDS in 2017. I think it's fascinating and it, and it shows your level of resilience and determination and just the standard that you must have been off to, you know, for as, in um you know going going through all of this and coming in for coming in fourth place you know two minutes off the podium which on a <laughs> which on a you know multi-day ultra state is so so close i mean just in, incredible did i just want to clarify, you you did win in 2017 didn't you yeah in 2017 i i did win and i i was sort of i came there to win I have no no problem admitting that I came there to win because what happened in 2016 was I I worried so much. I was worried about what everybody else had done, how much had they been training, like and you know it consumed me. And then I realized because I was I wasn't used to having this this pressure on me, I suppose, that that you sort of get when you you know you won something, everybody expects you to win again. And so you get this pressure on you and um you have to sort of learn to handle that and I guess I hadn't really done that yet but then in 2017 I was like well I can only do what I can do I have to focus on the things that I can control the things that are not within my control I just have to not think about those you know and and that's that's key for everything in life you know if you worry about things that you can't control you know you you're just not going to feel feel good you know that there's just no point in doing that so i i came to that realization should have done it earlier but anyway hey ho i did and so um i knew that i had done everything i had done the training i had meticulously gone over my kit over and over again i had done some altitude training i had done some uh, heat acclimation um i had um done meditation and i was very confident and um and and day one I just thought, well, I'm gonna show them why I'm here. So I set off at this ferocious pace until after five kilometers no one was able to follow. Mm-hmm. Um and then I knew that I had sort of told them <laughs> who was here to win. And it um it, it wasn't an easy ra- race, but it it did work and I did win. So yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah, I'm li- I was literally like, you know, when you, I, could, I can imagine you running off at the very start and just showing everyone, look, I am here and I am here to win. Do not mess with me. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was like. And I think after that stage, they were like, oh, my God, you were so strong. What happened? <laughs> I was just like, well. Was there a point where something changed for you? Um, and I don't know wh- whether that was, was mentally or something else happened or um about learning to deal with that pressure and making that change in your own mind on what to focus on, you know, not focusing on the things that you couldn't control, but focusing on you and your controllables. You know, I don't know if there was one moment or if it was gradual or whether you 
read something or spoke with a coach or something just clicked for you? Can you can you pinpoint it? I can't actually, but I, I think that it wasn't like this um, epiphany or anything. I think it was a, something a bit gradual. But I, I did focus more on um, mental training in those months and I can't remember like exactly all the books I read and things but I did get some tips and um and I read I read a couple of books and maybe that helped me yeah I mean massive congratulations you know two two time winner is is phenomenal yeah it's an incredible race and I know there's a there's a brilliant article on lessons uh where is it yeah lessons in badassery and uh, oh gosh, I've forgotten her name. Hold on, Katie. Yeah, sorry, Katie. Yeah, Katie. And Katie yeah. wrote this wonderful article about you, and she calls you the queen of the desert ultra, which I think <laughs> is just such an amazing, fitting title. I'd love for you to share just maybe some of your like top tips and advice for desert ultras for running, you know, in the heat, in the desert, in those challenging conditions. You know, what advice would you have? Well, first of all, I think you should always do sort of your research and know where you're going and what the race demands, you know, how long is the race, what is the course profile, how much elevation, what is the terrain like. But those are kind of basics. But then you can include, you know, specificity into your training. And I I think that's important. Most people walk a lot during these races, but they come from perhaps a running background and they don't really walk, particularly not men. You know, men tend to see it as sort of failure if they have to walk, but it's not. So you have to learn to become a fast walker and then you can really excel. So if you can mix the running and the walking. So that's what I would say is one thing. And then uh, the other thing is to do heat acclimation. So uh, our bodies are actually very well adapted to heat, but most people don't realize that or they're very, very uh, worried about going into the heat. But um, you can prepare, uh, you can adapt and um, acclimatize and it takes two weeks or something like that. So it's actually quite easy. It's it's, uh, much less complicated than going to... uh, altitude so that that should always feature because it can make a very big difference to your performance and then I think I mean there are many things that are important but you have to be flexible you have to have this um, kind of attitude where you're prepared for the unexpected to not let things like totally throw you you know if it doesn't go the way you planned it to so I have seen people who have been in an absolutely horrendous physical condition and somehow, you know, they pull themselves together and they finished and some with, you know, a fantastic sense of humor and, and, uh, and you know, like really seeming to uh, be enjoying it, even though maybe they had hardly any skin left on their feet or, you know, whatever it could have been. And at the same time, I have seen people pull out, but being absolutely fine, you know. And so a lot of it is in the head. And it's difficult to, to tell people how to how to train, you know, your your mental ability, in, you know, in, in an easy way. I think it, it is trainable, but but some people seem to have a bit more of just that um, kind of resilience and adaptability than other people do. I love what you shared about sort of the walking and the hiking, because I think I think it is fascinating because a lot of people who can do big distances quickly it's a real shock to their system when they do the same distance, but over a slower time period, because then it, you know, ends up being like more time on their feet, which maybe their body isn't, isn't used to. Um, And I know that you've gone out and done some, you know, incredible hikes. You've been out to, um, to Nepal and you've done the Everest base camp and fast hiking, the three passes trek in Nepal and the king of the trails, Kungsledan. (laughs) Yeah, Kungsledan. Yeah, very good. Kungsledan. I'd love for you to share more about those types of adventures that you've been on and you know and how they went for you actually I think going on adventures like that so um hiking um I I think it's I think it's fantastic and I I guess I really enjoy it because there is no pressure you know you don't 
you don't have to win. You know, it doesn't matter how how uh, fast or slow you are. You know, it's a it's a different reason why you're doing it. And you know, to be able to do that, to be able to really take the time to to um, you know look at the views and just soak in the atmosphere and talk to the locals and you know whatever it is. That's that's really like freedom for me because I you know when when you start winning races you can no longer go to a race and just plod around you have to <laughs> you have to run them fast because there's an expectation or you're invited or you know so those uh, kind of events i guess replace that which maybe races can give to other people but i i mean i still like to do things reasonably fast so like you mentioned you know this is not like hiking in a traditional sense it's a fast hike so I go very light, um, but actually you don't need very much. And that's the great thing that you learn from multi-stage racing, how little you need to actually survive, how light your equipment can be. And so it's always a balance between um, between being safe um, and having enough, but not carrying too much. But when you are able to go with just, um, you know, light equipment and a light backpack it gives you a lot of freedom and you can cover a lot more distance in a shorter space of time than you would have been able to do otherwise and nepal is just it's just absolutely fantastic um i've been there a few times a few times now i've done the everest uh, trail race which is a great multi-stage race and then i've been on these yeah the everest base camp trek and the three passes and it's, uh, yeah, all of those experiences were fantastic. I think it, going to Nepal is really humbling. You know, the people um, are poor. Um, I mean, Nepal is one of the world's poorest countries, but people are very generous, uh, friendly. You feel very safe. Um, and then, of course, going up in the mountains, I mean, it's just breathtaking. You, know, just, you, can't, really, you can't really explain it. You have to go there. <laughs> those have been really good experiences and then um i did uh, this uh, kungsleden trail in sweden which is um 440 kilometer long trail which i did with um sandra who's now my husband and we did that in uh, 2017 in september and that's actually how we got to know each other really well so we did that as friends uh, and sort of nothing happened and it was after that that things started to um, yeah to develop between us. And um, uh, actually, it's uh, it, it was kind of tough because we did a lot of distance every day, and he actually ended up setting a record on the trail. And had it not been for me, he would have been even faster. But uh, but I think he enjoyed my company, so that's okay. And we had a fantastic time. And and I think um, uh, I mean it sounds a bit it sounds a bit ridiculous because of course everybody can't do that but it's it's like something like that everybody should do you know before they enter a relationship you know if you spend like eight to 11 hours or 12 or whatever it was every day on the trails for a week you carry very little with you and um, you just sleep in very simple conditions and that it's incredible how well you get to know a person and you can't hide your character so you learn a lot about what people are really like when things get a bit tough and that's very good I think oh I totally agree I totally agree <laughs> I always remember these stories of like friends who would um you know they've been together for ages you know four or five years and then they decided to go backpacking or traveling together you know seven eight days later they've broken up never speak to each other ever again and then other people you know similar to you you know start out as friends and then go through this challenging amazing um experience and actually people see you at your at your worst and at your best <laughs> they see you yeah. at, you know at six in the morning with no makeup on haven't showered for a week eating from exactly. a pringle box or whatever yeah yeah <laughs> it, it was like that as well we slept in a we slept in like this in a shed because uh, the actual hut was was uh, in a place it was full there were already like people there and it was really small so we had to go out and sleep in a in a shed that they used for cutting wood <laughs> so we were there like with like an axe and some <laughs> some wood and stuff and slept on the floor and then I drank coffee in the morning from an empty Pringles box you know it's like <laughs> 
fascinating. It does it does show you though, like what people are like when you know when it's when you're you know dirty and smelly and it's tough and and also when you're tired and you know because that's when your real emotion you can't mask it anymore. Like it's like your real emotions are there and mm. and like and your actual character. Um, does come out I'd love to talk to you about food as well I was reading on your website that you've changed over to a plant-based diet and I'd just love to know how that's going for you I changed uh, over to that in um, early 2018 because I had some health problems I basically like hit the wall and I started to read up a lot on the link between health and nutrition you know food chronic disease, all of those things. I thought I knew a lot, but actually I realized that there, there is a lot that I have overlooked. And that prompted me to move over to a plant-based diet. Um, I was strict vegan for about eight months. And then I introduced some eggs again and the occasional cheese. Like, yeah, you know, maybe I'll have some halloumi or manchego cheese or something like that once in a while um, but that's kind of it really so um, I don't drink milk I don't eat meat I don't eat fish so it's sort of vegan plus occasional egg and cheese basically do you find that harder on um, you know preparing your food for multi-stage um, ultra running like trying to get uh, you know the, the vegan food or plant-based food that will work for you or have you sort of um how has that been? No, I think it's it's actually very easy. Maybe because, you know, my majority of my running snacks have always been plant-based anyway. So that's not a big change. And meal-wise, there are a lot of vegan meals these days, uh, you know, freeze-dried meals. So that's not really an issue either. And if you do need um, some more protein as an athlete there are plenty of um, like vegan protein powders for example so it's easy to have a recovery shake so personally I, I, I find it very uncomplicated but I do understand that people struggle and I guess it just goes to show how much we rely on animal produce for our food I'm quite a creative person as well and I love cooking and actually cooking vegan food is really fun because you realize how much choice you have in terms of ingredients and and you can do you can do everything you know you don't have to have meat in a curry for example you know it's uh, and there's so many interesting herbs and spices that you can work with and so yeah I I think it's great and um, yeah I do all of the cooking at home and I love it just to say key thing for everyone is you know do you do what works for you <laughs> <laughs> i think there are a number of reasons that you know it would be good for people to eat you know more vegetables and less meat and you know um i don't want to just shove it down people's throats you know i'm not i'm not like that i wouldn't actually you know identify obviously i don't eat 100% vegan anyway but i never really identified as vegan because i think vegan is like this whole lifestyle and I mean I still have a down jacket and you know I still have leather shoes I'm not I'm not really there but I I do believe in eating a predominantly plant-based diet for long-term health for animal welfare and for the environment I mean there are so many good reasons and I don't think it has to be either or it's not black or white and that's the problem I think many people see it like that but you can make small changes and step by step and see what you think and I mean I think that, um, there is a, a wealth of research out there that just shows the long-term health benefits it's undeniable and um, I think people should should try it but it's it's difficult I mean it's so culturally rooted that we eat our meat and whatever it might be I mean I live in Norway now and I'm People just eat so much meat. It's crazy. Norway is really, really behind in terms of the, you know, the vegan stuff. Yeah. How was moving over to Norway? How was how was that as a transition? So what happened was that um, my husband and I, well, we had to decide where to 
where to live because he is um, he is Norwegian and he lived in Norway and he has um, two children here. And then, of course, I lived in the UK. And then we sort of thought that it would be better if um, for everybody if he could be closer to the children and his ex-wife and, you know, it would just make things easier. So, you know, I was pretty flexible and I am Swedish anyway. It's not such a big difference between Norway and Sweden. So, um, so we moved to Norway. So, well, I moved to Norway and <laughs> we bought the house. And um, so now we live in a ski resort um, a couple of hours north of Oslo. In uh, We actually live in like a ski cabin. It's like a small house normal it's like a house but it's a ski cabin anyway <laughs> it's lovely the the only thing for me is that it's been a move from you know a sort of the london suburbs to a really small place in norway and we have a lot of tourists in the winter but when they're gone you know there are some in the summer because they come from mountain biking and that but you know it's so like a small place and and i guess i'm sort of not so used to that. So it's difficult sometimes to not have like a big city that close, you know, like shopping, restaurants, culture, and that. Plus wine is so expensive. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, you know, when you cross the border to Sweden, you go to Sweden to buy wine, then you know you live in a country that's really expensive. <laughs> Is it a beautiful place to to run in? Is it easy to train there for your for your races? We we have everything on the doorstep here. So the snow is melting now. We have gravel roads. We have uh, mountain trails, like single track trails. We have the woods. We have the mountains. We have everything. It's on our doorstep. You just have to go out the door, and it's there. I was reading a blog post um, on your website, you know, reflections on the year 2019 and what's next. You are ultra running and you do your coaching in that area, but you also do health, sex and relationships, which is an incredible transition. And I'd love for you to share a little bit more about that aspect of it. Yeah, it's an eclectic mix now of things on my on my website. I guess I'm maybe confusing a few people, but basically... I have thought for a while that I'm going to study something and sort of develop myself in one direction or another. And, you know, I'm I'm 43 now and the body is kind of going, ah, do you have to do all this running? You know, it's not been particularly happy lately, I think. At the end of the day, you know, I think running at the level that I've been running at is not really healthy in the long term. I and mean, I can say that I just don't think it's healthy. And I think a lot of people, probably particularly women, at like top elite ultra running level, I doubt that they are particularly healthy or will be in the long run. But anyway, so I um I kind of thought, well, I want to do something more, and of course, you know, I have the coaching and that. But um, I I always like to to sort of develop myself. So I had a thought about studying nutrition because I'm very interested in that. But then I started to think about relationships and sexology and I'm not entirely sure how it all came about it was sort of a a gradual process but then I kind of had this epiphany because I was I was talking to another couple about something and then I sort of reflected on that and and other people I had talked to and I realized that actually that the relationship that I have now with my husband is just it's just so good and that but well, I mean I, I'm not going to describe that in detail but let's just say it's very very good and and we're very honest with each other and there's absolutely nothing that we cannot talk about and and there's a lot more to it but then I realized that a lot of people don't have it like that and I I kind of thought there's something here that I can do and also I think I'm quite a candid person I mean like I I I can talk about like anything. It doesn't embarrass me to talk about sex or relationships or intimate stuff like that a lot of people can't talk about. Um, so I thought, well, why not? Maybe this is this is it. So actually, it was my husband who found um, who found a course for me because it's not so. There are not so many courses that you can study, and then depending on where in the world you are, you know, you might have to 
have certain prerequisites and things. And uh, I have studied a lot before. It's just that I studied engineering. And so it's kind of a different area. Um, but I also studied a degree in change management. So that's very relevant because, you know, it's about helping, you know, people through change and that. So that comes in handy. But so anyway, we found this school in Denmark. And uh, right now we're studying online because of the COVID situation. But then it's going to move back to face to face. So it, um, it's a course in sexology and it's a course in couples therapy. So I will be fully certified in um, 2021, so next year. And while I'm doing that, um, I'm sort of expanding my coaching with, you know, the more I learn kind of thing and um, and take on uh, like clients as a, as a student until I'm fully certified. And uh, it's really interesting now that I, I decided to start to talk about it on my Instagram <laughs> and on Twitter. And I'm like... I did a lot of thinking before I started. I was like, should I just start a new account or should I use the same account? What should I do? You know, I went through all of these different scenarios and then I was like, oh, I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to use the same account because I can't maintain that many social accounts. And at the end of the day, it's me, right? I'm still running. I'm still doing running coaching, but now I'm moving into this. And I thought, I'm just going to talk about it and see what happens. And... I think I offended a lot of people. So I've had a lot of support. In fact, I've never had so much support and reactions to anything I posted. So that's been really good. I've had people reach out to me, you know, with private messages, asking for help with this and that, and um, being very encouraging and thinking it's great. And that I dare to talk about the things I talk about. And I have also had a large amount of people who have just unfollowed me. Um, so it's clear that it's not for everybody. Some people don't want to hear about anything related to sex or see it or, you know, and okay, that's fine. If you don't want to do that, you don't have to. But I guess I'm just fascinated by how controversial it is and how difficult it is for some people to talk about it. What's definitely, I think, coming across for me throughout all of our conversation is there's been a huge amount of like transitions and changes over, over the past sort of couple of years. But I'd love for you just to talk a little bit more about this, about the transition now, sort of starting to, to move away from running and ultra running. You mentioned that you're 43, you're starting to feel it now. And that, you know, obviously d doing this course on sex and relationships um, is going to add to your coaching um, and add to, to what you're doing. How are you finding that transition from leaving ultra running behind or sort of reducing your reliance on it to move into this other area? It's a great question. And um, I feel it's like a relief. I think that's because I, um, I've been doing ultra running since 2011. And I guess it was in 2015 that I, I started to win races and kind of did it more more seriously and so I mean it hasn't been that long that's five years but but at the same time it's like I said I think it's quite tough on the body and I think for me it's been tough on the mind as well because there are there have been a lot of other changes and things I have gone through simultaneously so the running and training at that level takes a lot of time and it stresses the body and so if you also have other things in your life that is occupying you, you know, taking your time and, and stressing you a bit. And the overall impact on the body is quite big because the body can't distinguish between stress from running and stress from work or, you know, going through a divorce or things like that. And, and that's what I keep telling my coaching clients as well. And a lot of people forget about that. They think that they can just get up at 4 a.m. and squeeze in the miles and everything will be fine. But it doesn't work like that. You need to set your life up so that you can also get the recovery and, and get that balance. And And I think I've had a little bit of lack of balance. And maybe that's why I feel like my body can't take much more of it at that level. And I need to be kinder to my body. And And also, it was great to run and win races, but I'm... I'm struggling to find the motivation. You know, I just don't know why, why I should 
do it again. I can't find those reasons for myself. Um, so I think I'm um, just kind of accepting that and saying, well, you know, why, why am I doing this? Do I have to do it? Can I do something else that maybe makes me happier? And sort of accepting that has made me a lot happier, actually. I'm not the sort of a person that will ever want to have, like, I don't know. I don't know what the normal life is, but, you know, I left nine to five for a reason. And uh, I, I don't want to go back to it if I can avoid it. I don't think I'm a very employable person, actually. I dislike authority too much. But um, <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to work for myself. But um, maybe that's sort of the common denominator for all of this is that I just I want to do something for myself, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a particular thing you know I think when I left my career for running I wanted to do something that I was passionate about but I don't think that it was the running as such that was the passion I have a passion for a lot of things but I think it was more to just have that freedom to be in charge of my life and what I do that was more what I wanted to achieve. That was the passion. And then I can express that in different ways and I can work with different things. We were emailing before the interview and you, and you sent me um, an email. And in it, you said about with COVID, you know, this has actually been very positive because it gives you this opportunity to reflect and actually gives you a way out of out of competitive running. And I think one of the key lines, you know, it sounds strange perhaps, but the running and at that competitive level wasn't really making me happy anymore. And I think that's just so powerful. It's it's almost like acceptance and sort of having that time to think, oh, you know, actually, maybe I'm not that happy anymore. How has this reflection process gone for you? I actually felt that what I was missing was some kind of intellectual challenge in a way. You know, we, we need a we need a number of different things to be to fulfill our needs and to be really happy in life. And I felt like that was something that was missing. So now I have that and I have this new focus. It's great. The process of reflection was a little bit painful, actually, because it it started before COVID. It did start before COVID. It's just that it took me a while to process it and to acknowledge to myself that yeah it probably is the running that I should change but I sort of felt like I think I just denied it but I realized like I wasn't happy to to train all the miles you know I felt like it was more of um more of a chore you know and of course it is you know all days can't be can't be happy days you know it's a job at the end of the day I'm sure all runners have have bad days but you know you have to go out and get the job done when it starts to feel like too much of a thing that maybe you're doing for someone else and not yourself then I think it's time to time to rethink things I mean, all of your races have been cancelled for for 2020. Do you think you'll run them in 2021 or do you not know? So I guess the the second half of 2020 is a little bit uncertain still. So there could be some races and then I'll have to make a call as to what to do with those. And I mean, I might run something in 2021. I think... Um, I don't want to like decide anything. Um, I still, uh, I mean, I still enjoy running. I would still like to, to do some races, but I think I would just like to do them in a different way, you know, so not be sort of the one coming there to win the race, you know, but more coming there to have a good time and, and enjoy it. Like I used to race before, before I got famous. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's still so much up in the air with 2020. You know, we don't know what is um, what is going to happen. But Elspeth, where is the best place for people to find more information out about you, to to follow you on on social media? Where where do you spend most of your time? 
Uh, also, I'm probably most active on Instagram, and I mean it depends a bit what you, you know what you're interested in. So, if you go on Instagram, I'd love for you to follow me on Instagram. It's an eclectic mix of a lot of things. There is some running, there is some um, provocative posts and articles about sex and relationships. Um, so, I would love for you to follow uh, there. I have picked up my blogging quite a bit again. So. Uh, elizabethbarnes.com uh, for the blog at Elizabeth Barnes on Instagram Elizabeth underscore Barnes on Twitter not so active there trying to but yeah not so good at maintaining everything and then Facebook is still um, you know, my Facebook page Elizabeth Barnes is about running and then eventually I will um, uh, create another page for more of my sex and relationship therapy and sort of that area Um, but that's uh, all in the making Elizabeth I'd love for you to share some final words of advice final words of wisdom around making changes in your life around transitioning into different areas Um, yeah what's what's your advice for for women out there who who are going through a change oh gosh so first of all I think that change is scary we tend to resist it but we are actually very adaptable. And at some point, you're just going to have to look beyond your fears and just say, I'm just going to go for it, you know. So I think just go for it. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? I've thought that many times. What is the worst that can happen? And life is short. So I think if you think about those two things, hopefully, you know, you're, you're able to kick things off. And then it can be useful to have, depending on what you're doing, but try and find a mentor. So I've had people who have helped me in different ways. For example, like selling my business was a long process. And um, I had a good mentor who supported me when I went through my divorce. I had some people who helped me you know, with that. So, and it, it doesn't have to be anything very formal or, you know, but just make sure that you have people around you that you can talk to um, because sometimes it's easy to maybe lose perspective or worry about things so I would say that and then believe in yourself you know you have to believe everything will be fine and you just have to keep believing in what you're doing and and what we talked about you know being authentic you know when you try to achieve something you will always have people who don't understand you you will have some haters, but you can't think about that. It happens to everybody. You know, just focus on um, the positives, take care of the people who support you and um, go your own way. Elspeth, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you for the Tuck Girl Podcast Extra and best of luck with whatever future changes happen and good luck with the sex and relationships course and um yeah i know people will be excited to follow um along with your journey yeah thank you so much it was it was really great to catch up again and uh god knows where we'll be in five years so <laughs> we have to do this again in five years and <laughs> exactly. see what's happened then <laughs> Hey Tribe, how you doing? I hope you are well. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Elizabeth. I always think it's fascinating to catch up with our previous guests to see what they have been up to in the interim since we last spoke with them. Everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes, so please do go and visit toughgirlchallenges.com. When you go and visit the website, I basically like to think of it as the as the central hub for Tough Girl Challenges. It will give you links to all of our previous guests. There's show notes, there's blog posts, there's links to the books that I've written. There is links to the different challenges that I've done from um, from through hiking the Appalachian Trail in 2017 to cycling Pacific Coast Highway, walking the Camino Portuguese, hiking the Lycian Way and, um, and completing the Overland Track, which I did earlier this year in 2020. You can also find links to the Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube and all that jazz. So please do go and check it out, spend some time, have a little look around, see what Tough Girl Challenges is all about. There's also more information about me. And there is also 
the amazing patrons and supporters page on the Tough Girl website. There's over 290 names of individuals, men and women around the world who believe in the mission of the Tough Girl podcast to increase the amount of female role models in the media. So a massive thank you to every single patron who is supporting the work that I do. It makes such a massive difference having a regular source of income. If you enjoy listening to Tough Girl podcast, if it's motivated you, if it's inspired you, if you want to pay it forward, if you want to be involved in the mission, then please do go and visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast, and you will find the different levels that you can support at, you know, $2 a month, $5 a month. It makes such an incredible difference. And then I will add your name onto the website and you can become one of the amazing patrons of the Tough Girl podcast. Just want to share a couple of episodes that we've got coming out in the coming weeks weeks. So next week, we're going to be catching up with the awesome Jessica Dixie Mills, who you may know as a um, as a YouTuber and a hiker. She's got an incredible YouTube channel called Homemade Wanderlust. She's hiked the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail and the Continental Trail Divide. But most recently, she was over in France and Spain walking um, the Camino, the Way of St. James on the French Way. So Dixie comes back on the Tough Girl podcast and shares more about her experiences of walking on the on the Camino. So that's a really, really great episode to listen to. And then after that, on the 10th of July, we're going to be catching up with Paula Maguire from Paula Must Try Harder. Paula's going to be sharing more about her year of fear. She tells us more about some of the different challenges that she's taken that she's taken on to face up to her nightmares and figuring out what she should be scared of and what she shouldn't be scared of. She also shares more about the everyday adventures that she's going after this year. So absolutely fascinating. It's always fun to catch up with our previous guests. Paula, if if you haven't listened to our first episode, is basically, in, in the words, is the most unlikely adventurer or the world's least likely adventurer. So she went from being an anxious recluse to a trier, a speaker, an author, and some days a trainee astronaut. So Paul Maguire is the world's least likely adventurer with the world's most inspiring adventure story. So it's well worth listening to that episode. The first episode that we actually did with Paula, um, which would have been in 2019, I think, actually I entered for the She Extreme Best Adventure podcast award in 2019, which the Tough Girl podcast ended up winning. So that's another really fantastic episode and well worth listening to. So a massive thank you to everybody for subscribing, for leaving a review for telling one friend about the tough girl podcast that is the way that the message gets out there and encourages more women to listen and to hear these incredible stories of adventure and challenge and i hope it inspires you to go after your own adventure and do your own challenge but wherever you are whatever you are doing give it your all give it 110 percent. get after it and just go for it take care lots of love and i'll be back with you next tuesday for another awesome episode of the tough girl podcast take care bye